Okay, and Tam has to sit right there too. Now, again, I, we, we make far too much of a fuss over looks than we ought to, and I, I know that's wrong, but, uh, but nonetheless, I'm going to tell you this, is try and get laughed. <laughs> I don't know for a fact, but I have been told by several of my co-workers that Tempest had a tattoo on her inner thigh that showed a clown holding a yardstick with the words, you can ride this ride if you were this tall. <laughs> You know, and I'm thinking about her and I'm thinking about her and I'm thinking about, you know, the, the fucking water is so beautiful. When you walk outside, you were just startled. Steam rising off water that just made you rise. It was insanely beautiful, the, the land itself. It would, it would change you to see it. You would not be the same person. So anyway, I was sitting next to those two, and uh, oh, by the way, if you want a time reference, the TV was on the bar, and Boris Yeltsin was standing on a tank, and uh, you know, so we were, you know, looking at that. So I'm not sure what the date of that event was. It was when you know there were those problems in Russia. Anyway, uh, Roger just looked at that and kind of coughed and spat what looked like a baby bird on the floor. <laughs> and meanwhile, there's and Tempest. See, the thing with Tempest was there was there was a poetry about it. They didn't just come up and, and you know, and summon her to go out to the, the uh, RV that, that those two owned that, they, that, that she would take her customer to. And first, you had to present her with hot wings, <laughs> which she would devour in seconds and make it a little bone pile. And so, you know, some water would be over there playing pool. Would do this and send her, and then she realized that he was interested, and then they'd go off together. Now, I was standing next to those two, and the tension was unbearable. And I had a dumbass at that point. And the words, want to hear a joke, came out of my mouth. Tempest continued her feast. Roger's jaw dropped a bit, and he looked at me with sort of a tired surprise. I mean, I doubt anyone in his life ever asked him if he wanted to hear a joke. And he did not respond with gunfire. He just, he, he said, okay, so, and this is the world's oldest joke, probably. Uh, studio audience, do not shout out the punchline before I get done. <laughs> so I told him this. A skeleton walks into a bar. The bartender says, what do you have? The skeleton says, picture a beer and a mop. Wait for it. No. So anyway, Roger, the scourge of the inside straight, actually laughed. It was a stunted, rusty laugh. And it set off a coughing fit, but he did laugh. Now, Tempest didn't understand the joke, and I had to explain it to her. But once I, she understood that a skeleton drinking beer would, it would flush out. Oh, the before, I did everything but put on a puppet show. <laughs> and then she laughed. She thought it was pretty good. I want to hear another joke, she said. And so I followed that up with, a horse walks into a bar. The bartender says, hey, why the long face? <laughs> and this dude, that, that, they liked it. They hadn't heard it. Everything was swell. <laughs> a fresh plate of hot wings arrived. And so, uh, anyway, there they were, and there I was, and then rescue. There was an animatronic pirate who came up and he was pretty scary looking. He was all ears, nose, hat, and mustache, and he was wearing a like everybody did when he said so like vest. And uh, he began complaining loudly to Roger about some guy named Kenny who was really pissing him off. And this this was my opportunity to flee. Which I did. I bolted, I got out of there, I didn't want to overhear anything that might get me wrapped up in chain thrown in the bay. <laughs> now at this point there were to be more openings, but it'd be a number of days. So, um, unless I wanted to work in the cold storage units, 
which uh, a lot of guys did and so forth. I, I was going to bang at a lot of my friends and read, let's get out of here. Uh, there's not going to be a shortage of uh, hands here. You know, we might as well go. There's a ferry coming through uh, southbound the next day. And, uh, we'll go on down to California. So anyway, we had uh, like a day and a half to, to spend. And it was noon, and it was warm and sunny, probably 70 degrees. And it was quite balmy, and we were all still wretchedly hung over from the great party the, a few days before when they announced that we would start getting days off. And there was Tim and Tom from Texas, and uh, Space Ghost, I told you about him. Uh, just to, And uh, what we did was Space Ghost had uh, bought some marijuana from Roger Jolly, and they called it Thunder Club. It was locally grown. It was, uh, I usually believe in uh, obeying the laws of the community I'm in. Nonetheless, I, uh, Space Coast said, let's go down and look at the bears. You can go down to the garbage dump, and there they were, and they're big. And uh, we went down there, and I took a couple of us of that stuff, and the next thing I knew, it was just like, <laughs> look, I didn't catch my hand. <laughs> I was just, just having a peach of the time. And uh, there were the bears. And we were ridiculously close to them. We were closer than any right-minded human beings could ever be to an animal like they, in particular one of them, that we call the bear bear later because it was just huge in the brown bear. And then here was a bunch of bags of and, and another bear was ripping them open. There were a bunch of pizza crusts and boxes in there. And anyway, the bear bear stood up and right behind it was the sun. It made it just look like a black silhouette etched in brilliant red gold. And Space Ghost dropped his soda and said, bear. <laughs> so anyway, the bear bear looked at us as if we were pigeons and then walked over to where another bear was that was eating out of the bags of pizza boxes and it said, <laughs> like that. And the other bear just kind of went, like this, and the bear bear punched it in the stomach, and it sounded like a bag of cement hitting a sidewalk. It was just, <clears throat> we got out of there. We were like the three stooges. We fled. So anyway, not only that, but then we went to the dock. We still had time to kill. And uh, one of the Tim and Tom from Texas tied a hook to his toe. He's going to catch a herring just for fun. We're just lying in the sun, bless, after God knows how many days of just, you know, uh, of work that was just exhausting. And uh, so he's going to catch fish and, you know, he didn't like that. And then he got his hook, caught him on the dock, so he takes his watch off, sets it down, and reaches down, down into the water, and he gets the hook loose. And and then all of a sudden, it's like there's a lizard in a feathery suit, a black feathery suit, and it's big as like a three-year-old, and it lands, and it says, ah, like that, like it just beat our ass at ping pong. And it picks up his watch and flies away. It was a raven. What do you say to that, you know? And we're, we're pretty stunned and amazed, you know? It's man, the wilderness, and this guy's watch is flying. And he says then, uh, Tom from Texas says, you know, I've got the alarm set on that thing at 5 a.m. I doesn't really like that damn thing very long. So anyway, the next day, I, uh, I did uh, wander around on the island. I saw a, a hole in the ground where there was uh, one of those uh, rocks called garnets. There were just 
there everywhere. It was amazing. I was just uh, astounded. Uh, I climbed the mountain and I looked and I could see pods of whales moving up the strait. I saw a flock of bald eagles perched all over a 7-Eleven. I saw, I went into the 7-Eleven and they sort of little bells you could wear that would let the bears know you were coming in. And they would, they would, so they could go away. They would give you a wide berth. And uh, the little card on there it said, it is not advisable to wear bear, and enter bear and wolf country while menstruating or in the company of a person who is. <laughs> I'm not in hope and I'm not in Nebraska, I said to myself. So anyway, moving along and uh, we're going to fast forward now to a few days later. Uh, we got on the ferry, we went down to California. I was in sunny Santa Cruz, California and stayed with a friend of mine's sister. And uh, I, I need to confess now that I do have kind of a fondness for hippies and deadheads. And how can I not like them? I wrote, they laugh at everything I say. <laughs> so in Santa Cruz, I parasailed, just like a human type. I ate a squid sandwich you could park a bicycle against. It was great. And then the uh, hippies, were giggling and they led me to a gravel road and to it they grow the trees and they said yeah you're getting a little out of this in this grove of trees the monarch butterflies roost they migrate and they gather together in a huge swarm there must have been hundreds of thousands of them um, there they were flitting about from branch to branch they, they weighed down branches there were so many of them it was incredible I feel to this day grateful that I saw this. You could take a branch of a shrub or tree and shake it, and all of a sudden the air was alive with them. And there they were, and they, they were all flapping their wings, and it made a sound you didn't really hear. You just felt it on your skin. It was like. Like the unsnapping of a <laughs> I thought I, I, I thought I, I have never seen anything like this, and I probably never will again. I would not know what to compare them to before the fish in the sea. It was incredible. <coughs> so the next thing I knew then, uh, went back to there was no trip to Belize or Europe. I went back to Lake and discovered my. Roommate had, uh, well, left me with a sizable number of bills to pay, but I didn't know it at the time. There I was in that orange and black and white cloud of wonderfulness, and I was among the angels. And that is all of my uh, home and away story. And thank you.